Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to this talk. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I know there's so many different other presentations out there. Uh, so my name is Masha. Uh, I am a data scientist. Uh, I work as a consultant at Bouvet. I'm originally from Croatia, and at my free time, I am a full-time geek doing cosplay at science fiction conventions and stuff. So that's all to know about me. Now let's talk about my text summarization. So today, uh, our agenda for today is basically, first we're going to discuss a little bit, okay, what is automatic text summarization and why is it used and what are different types of text summarization. Uh, then we will discuss some methods and algorithms that are used today to summarize and that were used in the past to summarize text automatically. And in the end, we are going to discuss some of the evaluation methods. So how to know if our summaries are good enough. Now, text summarization is a very, very broad area. So there are many different uh, methods, many different algorithms. There is uh, many ways to evaluate your text summarization, different types of summarization. So of course, there is not enough time in one hour to go through all of that. So, you know, we're going to kind of try to summarize our summers, how to summarize. Uh, so first part is we talk will be what is automatic text summarization. Uh, basically, text summarization in general is the process of shortening a text document in order to create a summary with the major points of the original document. Now, automatic text summarization is the same thing, but just instead of having manual, manually created summaries, we are using software. Uh, now, there are many reasons to create summary, but first and foremost, the main reason is that we have more and more text data and less and less time to process it. So today, uh, I mean, even before we had a lot of text data, even when the text data was mostly written on a paper. However, today, uh, with all the digitalization and with the internet being the endless source of the text data, we are kind of flooded with the textual information. And it's really hard to find relevant information in all this amount of text. Uh, so why we need summaries? Well, one, one use case would be if really we don't have time to read the entire document. Then it would be great to have some automatic, automated way to actually create summaries so that people can just read the summary and get the information they need. On the other hand, sometimes that is not enough. Sometimes you do need, you need to go into details uh, and you do need to read an entire document, but it could be very useful to have a summary of the document so you can read it and see, okay, is this document actually relevant for me? Is this something that does, does this document actually contain the information I'm looking for? Uh, now, the problems we're dealing with in any kind of summarization both manual and uh, automatic is, well, first, how do we select the most relevant information from a source document? And then once we have this information, how do we express it in this final summary? So the objective of any summarizer is to write a program, basically our objective is to write a program that can reduce the size of a text while preserving all the main points of its meaning. So how to say the most important things in the shortest amount of time. And what we're trying to do with any summarizers, what our goals are, well, first of all, we want to optimize topic coverage and we want to optimize readability. So does the summary incorporate all the main topics from the document? And does the summary sentence flows in some kind of logical way? So can we actually read it and understand it? Now, there are different types of text summarization. Uh, and uh, one, of the, one way we can look at the different types is based on the input type. So when we're thinking about text summarization uh, based on the input type, there are two types. We have single document or multi-document classification. Basically, it's self-explanatory. In one way, we have only one document that we're trying to summarize. In this other one, we have multiple documents, and the final summary should contain information from all of these documents. Now, there is also... Um, division of text summarization based on context. And here we have domain-specific, uh, generic, and query-based summaries. So uh, 
in the main specific summaries, what we are actually, so we are using some domain knowledge. Uh, so what that means? That means that if you have some specific art, some specific text you're trying to summarize, for example, you're summarizing the scientific article in biomedicine, maybe you do have enough domain knowledge that you can incorporate in your model so that because as the domain expert in biomedicine, maybe you know uh, which, which uh, words could be the most important and which ones are maybe not relevant for the summarization and you don't want them ending up in your final summary. Now, query-based, uh, those are the type of summaries when the summaries kind of only contain the information about this, th that answers this natural language question you about the text. So those are, for example, those type of summaries, you know, when you're like searching for something on Google and then you get search results. And those search results are basically the website uh, for what you're searching for, but there is also a little paragraph down uh, underneath it that has actually all the words that are the most important, uh, all the most important sentences from that website that are actually uh, related to your search query. And of course, there are these generic summaries where our model does not make any special assumptions about the domain or about the type of content of text or the type of information it needs to get. And the generic summaries are basically the one where the majority of work has been done. Now, uh, probably the most important two types of uh, text summarization are actually based on the output type. Now, those are extractive and abstractive summaries. So uh, extractive summaries are actually summaries where the important sentences are extracted from text. So we just look into the text and then we find the most important sentences of the text and then we extract them. And then we actually, and then those sentences are what makes our summary. So something like this. Uh, on the other hand, this is not something how a human would actually write summaries, right? So when we write summaries, we actually read the text and then we, we, if I tell you summarize a book, you will not give me the most important sentences of a book, right? You will read the book and you're going to give me a summary using your own words. So you're going to be using some terms and some words that are not appearing in the original document. So this is what extractive summary, uh, this is the difference between extractive and abstractive summaries. Now, uh, if we try to take a closer look at these things, so extractive summaries, how they work? Well, as I said, we have some text, for example, Wikipedia article about Game of Thrones, and we want to create a summary of this, right? So what we do with extractive summaries, as I said already, we just select the most important sentences. Let's say those are these four or three and a half. So you can see here that, you know, uh, we are extra most of the time in extractive summaries, we are extracting entire sentences. So most of the time, but sometimes you would also maybe wanted to extract just piece of sentences that has the most information. So for example, in this second sentence, I, I don't think it is important that first book of A Song of Ice and Fire is actually Game of Thrones. So I have ignored that information. Uh, now, uh, one great thing about these extractive summaries is that you don't really have to worry about grammar. Because if the sentence in the original article was grammatically correct and you're just extracting th that sentence, of course, the sentence is going to be grammatically correct in the summary as well. However, there could be some issues with extractive summaries. And uh, one of the most important ones is the lack of balance. Uh, what can happen sometimes with the extractive summaries, let's say you have a document that consists of two topics. For example, even in this case, we have this per first paragraph that is talking about the production of the Game of Thrones TV show, right? Where it was filmed, how many seasons it had, what it was based on, who created it, and so on. However, on this other part, we actually have uh, another completely different topic that is talking about the story. Okay, so what are the story arcs? What are the plots in the Game of Thrones? So what could happen is that if you're just extracting and most important sentences, you could end up with summary that contains only sentences from the first paragraph and or only sentences from the second paragraph. So, and we said that, you know, topic coverage is one of the go main goals. We want to optimize topic coverage and here we're not doing it. So our, uh, in this case, our summary is definitely not balanced. Another problem that can happen is something that's called lack of cohesion. 
So lack of cohesion actually means this. Let's say I have extracted three sentences from this thing. So now first one is great. We know what Game of Thrones is. Second one says that filming location also include Canada, Croatia, Iceland, blah, blah. Now this, okay, kind of, we can read it, we can make sense. Doesn't make sense because it says also including, so there should be, obviously there is part of information missing from before. But this third sentence, uh, just by reading all those orange sentences makes no sense at all because in one sentence we're talking about where we're filming and then the other one is talking about this um, ruling dynasty, returning to the throne, fierce peoples, creatures from the north, and we have no idea what that, that is all about. And this is one of the most common problems that you can encounter with any kind of extractive text summarization. Uh, on the other hand, abstractive summary, well, Abstractive summary is much more similar to the way humans summarize, right? So when we summarize, as I said already, we don't just extract sentences. Um, our brain looks differently. We create, our brain creates this internal semantic representation of a text uh, that we just read. And then we, from that, we actually generate summary using our own words. So this was, for example, the summary I created from Game of Thrones article. Now, as you can see here, I am using new words. So instead of saying that American, that Game of Thrones is American fantasy drama television series, I'm saying it's a TV show, right? So I'm using the words that are not appearing in the original article. Now, um, this uh, this is actually uh, this um, this abstractive summarization is what we would like to accomplish. When, when we're in the end. So the end goal with the, the automatic test summarization, we would like to get something like this, right? However, this is quite difficult. Uh, techniques that we have to use for this are quite advanced. If we want to do any kind of abstractive summarization, we have to go with some uh, very advanced deep learning models. And even those are not giving us yet, at least, like very super awesome results in all of the scenarios. Uh, because as you can see here, there is a lot of domain knowledge that we have to have when we're doing uh, abstractive summary. Uh, so, you know, for example, here I'm saying that uh, it was filmed uh, across three different continents. Uh, now, for us, that of course sounds like a common sense. Everyone knows where these countries are. However, that is in the end, the domain knowledge about geography. If I haven't had that knowledge where Morocco is and Canada and so on, I wouldn't have known how to formulate this in the short way so that I can still give you the information about that there were multiple countries involved. Uh, so because of that, uh, the extraction methods are the still ones that are mostly used, even though they do not work as, as we would like it in the end. So uh, now we can go through some of the methods that were used or are used today for uh, uh, automated te automatic text summarization. Uh, so first method ever used for uh, automatic text summarization was something called positional method. And positional method was actually introduced in 1959, so 60 years ago. So this is not really a new thing, you know, people have been researching this for a while. Uh, and uh, so this Bexendale, uh, he published an article uh, where he was actually analyzing 200 paragraphs from the scientific documents. What he was trying to find, he, what he was trying to do is he was trying to locate the topic sentences. Uh, those are the sentences that are most related to the main topic of the article. And what he found out after analyzing these 200 paragraphs is that in 85% of the cases, topic sentence was the first sentence in the paragraph. And in the 7% of the cases, topic sentence was actually the last sentence in the paragraph. So this is basically how the positional method works. You have a paragraph and you just take first sentence and last sentence of the paragraph and you take extract that as your summary. Quite simple, right? So this, yes, was very simple and very naive approach, um, but it was actually quite reasonable, at least for the, for the type of the documents that he was trying to summarize, it turned out that it was actually working just fine. Uh, and uh, we are not doing this method anymore. However, this was the first paper in automatic text summarization. And a lot of works other that followed were actually kind of using this technique as a starting point. 
Now, the same year, in 1959, uh, Luhn actually came with a little bit more advanced method. Now, uh, what he was looking into, his, he was actually introducing the concept called frequency of content terms, which basically means frequency of words, right? So, uh, he analyzed, okay, how often the words appear in a document. And then, this is actually a chart from his original article. What he saw is that he was trying to find significant words. And what he saw was that, okay, th those words that appear the most and those words that appear the least in the article are not significant. So we can kind of remove them and not worry about them. Uh, and the significant words were actually in this interval uh, of in the, like in the middle range of the frequencies of the words. And uh, he was also uh, the first one to start with some data pre-processing before uh, doing any kind of automatic summarization. So he was removing stop words because if you think about it, this most common words, that's actually kind of the definition of a stop word. And he was also using stemming. So he was uh, like chopping out the suffixes of the word in order to get to the root form of a word so that machine knows that cat and cats are basically the same thing, that they are referring to the same animal. So how his method worked? Well, it was very simple. The whole idea was about selecting sentences with highest concentration of salient content terms, which again means just select sentences with most of the important words in them. So if we have a sentence that has 10 words, and let's say four of them are significant words, so four of them are in that middle range of that chart, uh, one idea here would be, okay, how to then say how important is this sentence? Well, we could just divide number of significant words with number of all words, so 4 divided by 10, which we would say, okay, score is 0 0.4. Uh, however, he did something a bit more complex. Uh, what he did was, instead of dividing with the number of all words in a sentence, he was actually dividing with the length of the span in which they appear. So basically, in this case, so he was just counting how many words are between first and the last significant word. So in this case, then he made this formula for the score, which was again quite basic. So number of all significant words squared divided by number of all words or all words in the span. In the span. And, um, you know, as you can see, this is actually a very reasonable matrix, especially for, you know, <laughs> 60 years ago, uh, because uh, it does take into consideration two very important things in the document summarization. First one being important words, and the second one being that they are highly concentrated next to each other, because we don't want them to be dispersed all over the document. Uh, now, 10 years later, in 1968, Edmondson came up with a new method. So he was actually uh, using some of the al already mentioned features. So he was using position of the sentence in a document, the same way as uh, Bexdale did. And he was also looking at the word frequency, the same as Loon. But what he added was something called Q words. Now, these keywords are manually selected words that are highly correlated with the importance of sentences. And there are three types of keywords. Uh, there are bonus words that are pointing to the important sentence. Uh, there are stigma words. They, on the other hand, have negative effect on the sentence importance. So most likely those are the words that you would expect that machine will treat as important, but they're really not. And there are also null words, which are ne neutral or irrelevant to the importance of the sentence, so they're kind of like a stop word, so you can just re like ignore them when doing the summarization. Uh, another thing he was looking into was the document structure. So is this sentence a headline? Is it a title? Is it the first sentence right under the title? And so on. And then, as the score for each sentence, he created some kind of linear combination of these four P features. And this is one of the algorithms that is still used. Uh, and uh, changing these Q words actually can change a lot the performance of your summarizer. So uh, actually, if you know that you can select, that you have enough domain knowledge to actually select proper Q words, here you can get very good results. However, it does require a lot of domain knowledge in order to do so. 
now uh, the next thing is completely different approach uh, that was done by because this is all more like statistical thing. Uh, however, the completely different approach was done uh, by De Jong in 1979. Uh, he created a program, a summarizer called Frump. And uh, this was the first knowledge-based summarization system. Uh, it was this template filling approach, so where it's trying to, all these template filling approaches are basically trying to obtain some predefined types of information that is specified in the slots of the template. Uh, and they're using some kind of information extract extraction methods. So each slot in the template represent one part of the salient information that we should take from the text. And so he created like this collection of some 50 so-called sketchy scripts. Uh, and they corresponded to the different situations that are often discussed in the news. So uh, each of these sketchy scripts then had this kind of like a formula that contained like the, each of these lines there. Slots were actually containing important events that we expect to occur in a specific situation. And then summarizer tries to read through the article and find those specific situation and fill up the holes in the actual script. And uh, so this is, for example, one of the scripts was demonstration script. And so it goes like, it starts with the demonstrators arrive at the location, they march, they arrive, uh, police arrives, then demonstrators communicate with the target of demonstration, then they attack the target, then they attack the police, and then in the end, police arrest them. Uh, so you can see that this is a fairly specific scenario. And when this happens, you know, uh, in an actual, when you have a demonstration, well, it may happen just like this. And uh, then you can actually fill up these holes quite well reading the article. However, um, once he tried to evaluate uh, his uh, summarizer, he realized that 50 scratchy scripts are just not enough to cover all the possible topics that you can find in the news. So then he, so he basically then realized that either he would have to do some more or you know, just uh, go with something else. Uh, now, uh, it was basically, uh, in 1995, when people started to use like a proper machine learning techniques for the uh, for uh, automatic text summarization, and uh, so first one of them was Coupier, uh, who was actually using the first trainable method. Uh, so he was trying to use he was using classification to create summary. Now classification is a supervised machine learning problem. So in order to you do any classification, we need to have a good training data set. We need to have some label data. So what he had is he had a list of about uh, I think it was 180 something documents. Uh, and he also had manually created extracts, meaning that he had people select sentences from these articles. And then he, of course, did some data pre-processing, and then he was actually tagging each of the sentence, labeling it with, so in a one document, so each sentence was labeled with one if this sentence ended up in a manually created extract, and zero if that sentence was not there. So then he actually created a training data set that he could use to create a classification model and to make predictions on the new data. For that, he used a uh, naive bias classifier, uh, which is basically working on the naive, uh, on the Bayesian formula, which tells you that the probability that the sentence S belongs to the summary, uh, given that it has some set of features, is the same as the probability that these features occurs if the sentence is in summary, times probability that the sentence is in summary, divided by the probability that these features occur together. Right, and then, um, since here we can actually assume statistical independence of the feature, uh, we can make it a little bit less simpler. So we can actually see here that what it really says is that probability that some that sentence ends up in a summary given certain set of features is basically the product of the probability of the individual features that appear for the sentences that appear in the summary. 
Uh, and uh, his model was actually performing quite well. So uh, for he was taking 25% extracts and he was getting a precision of 84. Uh, and for smaller summaries, he even got a 74% improvement over lead summaries, where lead summaries are the summaries where you just extract first couple of sentences from the text. Uh, and this was a method that was used quite long. It was giving okay results. Um, however, in 2002, Miles Osborne uh, actually published a paper where he showed that there could be better models for classification uh, of these sentences than naive bias. So he actually saw that these maximum entropy models are performing better uh, because he actually, he, he realized that those features are not really independent. Like, so so the, the probability that, you know, the position of the sentence maybe and the number of stop words in the sentence and all the different features you can use, most likely are not independent with one another. So then we can use other approaches. Uh, now, one of the problems that can happen uh, when you're working with uh, the text summarization is that what if you have, especially when you're working with the text summarization from different documents, what if you have the sentences that are talking more or less about the same thing? Uh, in that case, if those sentences contain some very, they both are gonna contain a lot of information and they're gonna both get high score based on any kind of metrics you're using. So what happens then? And in 1998, uh, there was, um, a matrix called maximal marginal reference that was introduced. Now, this one was used uh, for query-based summaries, uh, so, but there are other methods very similar to this one that are, then you can use for generic summaries and so on. Uh, however, this was one of the first methods, and what it actually says here, how the, 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 this method actually works, is that we have a, so we have a user query, and we also have some kind of similarity metrics, which we defined ourselves. And then the, um, what we want actually, so here we're taking into consideration both how similar the sentence or the document, you know, this is also for the information retrieval documents, the same thing. So how similar is the sentence to the actual query, but also we're taking into consideration, okay, how similar uh, is the sentence to the sentences that were already extracted to the summary. Because if we have two sentences that are, you know, more or less of the same importance and more or less talking about the same thing, then if I give you to read first sentence and then I give you the read second sentence, then marginal value of this second sentence is actually very low because you already have that information. So instead of that, we want some sentence that maybe has a higher, lower value, value but it's still contributing with the information to the actual summary. Uh, okay, so um, one other approach was MEET, which was introduced in 2000, uh, in 2000 and this was actually a centroid-based method. So uh, it was working both for uh, single and multi-documents. So how this method works, uh, basically we, uh, let's say we have some sentences, again, from the different uh, documents. And then we represent these sentences in some vector space, as dots in some vector space. Okay. So now one thing, first thing we want to do is we want to cluster them into some topics. So here we can see that we kind of have two clusters of sentences talking probably about two different topics. And what we uh, first try to find is these centroids. So centroids are centers of the mass of individual clusters. So these are our centroids. And then we actually uh, select the sentences that are the closest to the centers of the topic. And of course, in this case, again, especially if we're de dealing with multi-document summarization, there is that problem that we mentioned before now about maybe we'll get the two of the same sentences. So again, here we are going to be doing some re-ranking methods using some re-ranking metrics to actually select the, the sentences that are the closest to the centroids, but also different from one another. Uh, now, there has also been a lot of uh, these uh, graph-based methods throughout the years, uh, and uh, one of them is a method called LexRank. 
so uh, this is a graph-based method that was introduced in 2004. And uh, the whole idea behind it is something called lexical centrality. So how this method works? Well, um, so we have some document or, or multiple amount of documents. And then we create something called similarity matrix, where basically we're looking into, okay, how similar are each two sentences in the document or in the corpus of documents to one another. And then uh, we actually uh, represent each sentences as the nodes in the graph. And then we're looking into, okay, which sentences are connected, right? Uh, so, because then if the sentences have a lot of similarity, a lot of, for example, similar words or something, they're, then they're going to have a high value in the similarity graph. Uh, so this is an example from uh, the original article. And so here we have uh, 11 sentences from five different documents that are talking, um, well, more about the same thing, right? Uh, so, and about the same event. Uh, so here, for example, D2S3 means this is the third sentence from the second document. Uh, so, as I said, we start with building this similarity matrix. Uh, and now this similarity can be either cosine similarity or Jacardi similarity, whatever similarity you you decide to use. So we look into, okay, how similar are our sentences? So obviously all the elements at the diagonal here are one because the same sentences one and one are the same. Uh, but we are also very interested in those sentences where these similarities are as high as possible. So now we represent each sentence as a node, and then we are looking into, okay, are they connected and how are they connected? And then what we do, we actually look into different thresholds. So um, the sentences D5, S1 and D5, S3, they have this really thick uh, black line. So uh, the same as D1, S1 and D2, S1. So those are the two sentences that in our uh, similarity matrix actually have the highest score, the, so the, they have 0 0.45 and 0 0.38. So this is what happens. So these two are basically the only connection we have if we put a threshold to 0 0.3. Now, the more we're lowering the threshold, as you can see here, the more connections we get. So the main idea is basically to have, if the sentence is connected, to many of the sentences, that means that one sentence is similar to many of the sentences, that is one of the sentences that we should consider to put into our final summary. Uh, and so basically the, the whole idea about this is that kind of one sentence recommends the other similar sentences to the reader. So if, uh, so if it's very similar, it would be of great importance. But also importance of the sentence is coming from the importance of the sentences that are recommending it. So this it does sound a lot like a page rank al algorithm that's used by Google, and it is working on the same principle. Um, and uh, there is also another very, very similar method called text rank, and it's working more or less the same. Uh, there were just two different methods that were created approximately at the same time, but two different groups of people. Uh, and they have small differences. For example, text rank is used mostly for single document uh, summarization, while X rank is used mostly for multi-document uh, summarization. Uh, also, the similarity matrix used for this similarity ma matrix are slightly different, but in the end, it is the same approach and the same formula. Uh, now, uh, if you remember so far, we were, I mean, we we're mostly talking about extractive text sum uh, summarization method. And as I said, you know, we will be focusing on this more uh, because they are easier. Uh, and we did have a little bit of kind of abstractive method because with FRAMP, because FRAMP was like a slot filling uh, knowledge based um, summarizer. And, you know, by the definition of abstractive summarizer, uh, FRAMP was abstractive because it was the final summarizer was actually using the words that don't appear 
in the original document. And those were the words that were like th between those slots that were needed to fill. So it was kind of very basic type of uh, abstractive summarizer. Um, however, uh, uh, most of these abstractive summarizers are quite complex. And in order to do them, uh, in order to actually work with them, what we need is uh, we need some deep learning knowledge, right? So uh, the, the most commonly used method for abstractive text summarization is the sequence to sequence method, which is a deep learning technique that was introduced by Google team in 2014. So it is called sequence to sequence because it takes sequence as an output and it also has uh, it, uh, it takes sequence as an input and it also giving us sequence as an output. And this is what we need for working with you know, text data uh, because text is actually nothing but a sequence of words. And one of the important thing in the sequence is it's, it's super important to know where things are, where words are. So the, the, we, the, word one, the word two is depending on the word one uh, when we're making a sentence as humans and we want the same thing uh, from the machines. Uh, so uh, just a quick overview of how this goes. I will not go into details here, uh, but basically here we have an original document. So each of these inputs are just set words in our original document. So we put that as an input in our model. Now, the model itself consists of three parts. First, we have an encoder part. Then we have some middle part called encoder vector. And then we have the decoder part. So first we're encoding, and then we have to decode what we encoded in the previous step. Uh, so this encoder part, that's basically first one, is basically a stack of several recurrent units uh, that are that each each of them accepts one element, one input element, so one word, and then uh, what this then each of them actually collects information for its input from its input so from one word and then propagates it further on to the next recurrent unit uh, the the output of this encoder part is actually the encoder vector now we can treat we can think of this encoder vector as being like the last hidden state of the encoder part of the model now encoder vector itself basically it aims to encapsulate all the information for all the input elements uh, in order to help the decoder make accurate predict predictions and create the final summary. And encoder vector is then also acting as the first hidden layer, first, uh, first hidden state of this decoder part of the model. Now, decoder network, well, that's again, uh, uh, here we have again several neural uh, neural this this recurrent units and each of them is actually predicting one part of the output uh, and then it also propagates the knowledge to the next recurrent unit and what you can see here is that okay so first this first recurrent unit is going to create output one and then what goes into the second one will be some uh, you know, hidden state from the recurrent unit, but also we're taking into consideration the output one when we're doing dealing when we're trying to predict output two. And that is because you know what, what is going to be the second se word in a sentence depends on what is the first word in a sentence. And in the end, finally, we get our summary. So this is just a quick overview of the sequence to sequence method. There's much more uh, going on out here, uh, but it is, and you know, this is not the only thing, only way you can do the automatic abstractive summarization. Uh, there are other methods and you can also use the reinforcement learning and all kinds of different things. So this is an area that's improving uh, every day. So new alg algorithms are coming and I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's gonna get much, much better with time. Uh, now, uh, the last part of this talk is about evaluation. So now we know how to create these summaries, but are they good? How, how good they are, basically? So what makes a good summary? So as I said before, we have two goals with summaries. We want to optimize the topic coverage and we want to optimize readability. And we can look into different evaluation criteria for this. 
so for example, one of them being salience. Are we capturing the salient, the most important information of the document? Length. Is the summary of a proper length? Is it too, we don't want it to be too short, we don't want it to be too long. Um, what about the structure? Is it structured well? Is it coherent? Can we actually read it? Are there some weird pronouns that are happening or referring to the other things? Uh, is it balanced? Are we covering all the topics from the original document? What about the grammar? Is it grammatically correct? And also, is it non-redundant? Are there still maybe some parts of the summary, summary that we could exclude and still get the complete information? And now, one of the, the things we would like to see here is we want to optimize this information content. Basically, what we want is to optimize the compression and retention ratio, where compression ratio is just telling us, OK, what is the percentage of the original document that ended up in the summary? And uh, retention ratio is telling us, OK, what is the percentage of information of the original document that was preserved in the summary? Uh, and so obviously we want to say as much as possible in the shortest amount of time. So obviously we want to have very low, comp uh, very high compression ratio, uh, very low compression ratio, and very high retention ratio. So we want to have as much information possible in the shortest amount, uh, in the shortest number of words. Uh, now there are two different methods to evaluate these uh, models. Uh, Ectrisic techniques, uh, those are the ones that are task-based. And uh, those are probably the better ones to actually evaluate the models. However, they do require a lot of manual work. So how they work? You have a group of users, and you divide your users into two groups. One group, you give a complete document. Other group, you give a summary, and you give them some task. Maybe they can classify these documents into a set of predefined cl classes. Maybe they can try to cluster these documents. Maybe they can try to, maybe you can ask them some question about information in documents so they have to retrieve that information from the text. Now, if the group that has only read the summary can actually make the same decision and, and have the same results on this task as the group who has read the whole document, then you know that your summaries are good because then somebody can actually just read the summary and get the whole information. Uh, however, that does require a lot of time and a lot of people to actually be part of your little experiment. So usually we are not doing that. We're focusing on some intrinsic techniques that are basically about comparing summaries against golden standards. So you have a summary created by a human, and now and then you create the automatic summary from the same text, and then you compare, okay, how similar they are, how similar are Automatic summary, summary is to the ideal summary made by human. So there are different uh, approaches to how to actually, uh, uh, um, what different metrics uh, to calculate how good our summaries are. One of the basic ones uh, is precision and recall. Now, if you've been working with any machine learning, you've heard about these terms. So uh, let's say we have a document that has 10 sentences. And we are only trying to, and we say, okay, we want to extract two sentences out of it. And we create an ideal human-based summary that says selecting sentence number one and two. Now, if we have two different summarizers, let's say one automatic summarizer one using one method and maybe a summarizer two using other methods. So we want to see, okay, which one of them is better. Uh, now, what we can do is we can create something that's called confusion matrix. Uh, now, confusion matrix is looking into all the different pairs of what can happen, has the, when machine selected sentence and human not and so on. So this is what our confusion matrix basically looks like. So the true positives in this matrix well, that's basically just the number of sentences that both human and summarizer selected. Uh, true negatives are basically those sentences that both human and summarizers did not select into, uh, into the summarizer. Uh, and then, for example, false negatives, those are the ones that our machine did not select, but human actually selected. So those are the ones that we said are negative, but they should be actually positive, and so on. And for this, we can actually make two different met metrics called precision and recall. Precision is basically number of true positives uh, divided by number of false positives and true positives. So that's what this means. So 
false positives and true positives, those are all the sentences that machine thinks should go into the summary. So what this measure tells us is out of all the sentences that machine selected, how many of them are actually correctly selected? How many of them human selected as well? Uh, another method, another measure is recall. And recall tells us, on the other hand, okay, so here we have true positives plus false negatives. So this is uh, out of all the sentences that human selected, how many of them has machine selected as well? So in our case, in this case of this summarizer, let's look into the sum summarizer one obviously has a perfect score. So uh, it has two to true positives and divided by two, so the score is one. Both precision and recall can go between zero and one, and we want to have them as high as possible. So since the summarizer one exactly extracted the same things as human, obviously that's a very good summarizer. However, summarizer two, well, true positives is one, and false positive plus true positive is two, so here we have 0 0.5. And the same for recall. So it was only able to capture one sentence that out of two that human did. So in this case, we would definitely say, okay, summarizer one is working much, much better than the summarizer two. However, what is an ideal summary? What if we had two sentences that were talking about the same thing and they were very similar and even human had to struggle. Okay, maybe the sentence two and sentence four are super similar, giving the same information. And even human didn't know, okay, should I go select sentence two or four? So human decides, okay, I'm gonna go with sentence two. And then when creating the summarizers, we had maybe a different re ranking ma uh, ma like ma matrix so that we could then maybe summarizer one be based on the metrics selected sentence two and summarizer two selected sentence four. Uh, so that's why maybe a better method than precision recall is called utility. So how utility works is that instead of just having these, uh, so uh, just uh, having people select the, uh, what are the two most important sentences, we also want them to rank those sentences as well. So we want them to say, okay, what is the most important sentence and then the second most important? So give all our sentences some points. So let's say that then human have this ranking for these five sentences. So human says, okay, sentence number one is the most important. So obviously it's gonna get number 10 points. Now sentence number two gets nine points, but sentence number four actually gets eight points, right? They're very similar and we, maybe we could also go the other way. Maybe another human would do the other way, the, this opposite. Now in this case, summarizer one actually uh, he gets 19 points because uh, summarizer one selected first and second sentence. Uh, so first sentence 10 plus second sentence nine. And summarizer two, in this case, well, it gets 18 points uh, because it selected sentence of a 10 points and sentence of uh, eight points. Now you can see that, okay, summarizer one is still performing better. However, it's not that big of a difference, right? Because last time we had from 0 0.5 to one, that was a huge difference in precision and recall. However, here, well, it's just one point difference. So even if we go with summarizer two, well, it won't be that big of a deal, right? It's still very, very similar. Now, uh, another problem is that, oh no, who says what's the ideal summary? Uh, I was working on the project where I was supposed to extract, uh, I was supposed to create this extractive summarization, uh, and uh, I needed to evaluate my summarizer as well. And then I asked a couple of my colleagues if they can help me with that. So if I can, because I needed this ideal summary so that I can compare with my models. Uh, and I asked four colleagues, I gave them five different articles to read and to extract N sentences. Sometimes five, sometimes 10, doesn't matter. And once they get the results back, well, first of all, you know, uh, I said like for one article, give me five sentences and then half of them gives me six, and some of them gives me four and so on. So machine at least gives you the number of sentences you want, right? <laughs> Unlike humans. But other problem was that once I was comparing the results from them, 
there was not a single article where two humans out of four gave me the exact same sentences, not a single one. So sometimes I had a bit of overlap, but sometimes I actually have two people, same article, completely different 10 sentences. And these were small articles, these were not like books, you know, so you can kind of randomly pick, you know, 10 sentences. So it was, it was really crazy how people consider differently information. And, and what happened was this, you know, through the article, some information was mentioning more than once, and then one person selects first time, and the other person selects it when it appears second time, and so on. And uh, so there is actually a measure called relative utility that is also taking this into consideration. So not only looking into one ideal summary, but also looking into taking more summaries from different people and trying to compare them all and see, okay, how does our summary actually work to the, given this whole set of summaries. Uh, and uh, Rouge N is actually the method that is, uh, like the metrics that is also incorporating this. And this is probably the most important metrics for um, evaluation of the automatic summaries. Uh, it is based on another metric score blue, which is used in machine translation. Now, the difference between the two of them is that you will get a very high blue results if you actually have a high precision. So if your summarizers have high precision, then you will get high blue. However, on the other hand, uh, if you have a high recall, you are going to get the high rouge results, and the high rouge results are the, what, I, what we want. So actually, in rouge, uh, R rouge and R, R stands for recall. So how does this method work? Well, it is actually comparing the automatic summary, but in this case with a set of reference summaries, so not just one. And what it's using, it's using the n-gram overlap between the documents. So n-gram is basically just sets of words. So one gram is one word, two gram is two words, three gram, three words, and so on. Uh, so this is what actually gives us then the, the, the ability to see, okay, how is this working given the whole corpus of different summaries created by different people. Uh, and this is the formula for this, and basically it's, it's very simple. So it's just a number of these n-grams that are appearing in uh, both our automated summary and in all these summaries that were created by humans, divided by number of n-grams that are appearing in all these summaries that were created by, in all these reference summaries. Uh, and there are other uh, there are other rouge methods. So, for example, rouge L, which instead of this uh, n-gram overlap, it overlap is looking into the longest common sequence between the automatic summary and between the, these different manual summaries, uh, and many more. Uh, another method, uh, the last one I will be talking about today, is called pyramid method. And uh, this is the method uh, that is uh, based on semantic content units. And it is used for multi-document summarization mostly. Uh, so what are these actually these semantic content units? So here what we have, let's say we have uh, four sentences from four different documents. Now all these sentences again are more or less the same. So. Donald Trump won the presidential election in 2016 in USA. This is what they're all talking about. So now, obviously, one of the things that we don't want is extract all these four sentences because they are giving us the same uh, information. However, these are just sentence, one sentence from each of the article. Now, what we do here is we create these units uh, that then are kind of parts of the information that appear in multiple documents. So in our case, we have this first semantic content unit one, which is inform information that tells us that Donald Trump became president of United States. Okay. And it has the weight of four because that is the information that's appearing in all four documents. On the other hand, this second sentence, uh, this sentence, a second semantic content unit is telling us when it happened. So it happened in 2016. It gets way three because actually the third, the third sentence, the sentence from our third document does not say when it happened. So we have only three occurrences of this 2016. So then this semantic unit gets 
um, gets weight of a tree. And then we create this kind of pyramid structure. So in our case, we, since we have only four sentences from four documents, well, we have more sentences, but there are only four documents. Um, so we, we, we are looking into, okay, into weights of these semantic units. So um, obviously, uh, it doesn't even matter what these documents are about. You know, they could all be about Hillary Clinton. Uh, uh, so, but what is important, obviously it is important for all of those documents, this information about Donald Trump. Because if it wasn't, that information will not be appearing in all four documents. So this is why, since this is a very important information, we want this information to be captured in the final summary. So we want to have one sentence, doesn't matter any one of, we don't want all four of them, but we want at least, we want one of them to appear in our document. So we want somewhere to be read that Donald Trump won the election in the United States in 2016. So once we create our summary, then we just look into the summaries and check, okay, how many of these semantic units they actually have. So if we have uh, one summary that has one semantic unit of weight four and two semantic units of weight three, so maybe there was the third semantic unit that was talking about, I don't know, Monica Lewinsky, doesn't matter. Uh, so then this summary gets uh, 10 points based on the weights. On the other hand, if we have summary that looks like this, summary that has one semantic unit of the weight four, one of the weight three, and one of the weight one. So here we know that we have eight, so eight points. So in this case, summarizer one is better than summarizer two. Also, if you get the summarizer that have the same not necessarily the same amount of points, because what you want is to have those summarizers that had most of the points on the top of the pyramid. Because you don't want a summarizer in this case, if you get a summarizer that has 10 points, but all of them being of the weight of one, uh, well, that summarizer is not so good because <laughs> the most important thing here, the weight four is not actually part of the summarizer. So this is where a very good method to actually, you know, evaluate your summarizers, and this is work for multi-document summarization. Now, as said already, there are many different methods, many different approaches, uh, many different evaluation methods you can use. Uh, last thing I want to mention are the tools. So if you want to get into this, what tool should you be using? Well, there's Python. Python is way to go tool for any kind of data science projects these days, uh, especially for any kind of natural language processing problems. And there is a very awesome library called Sami that actually has all these predefined functions. So you can see that some of them we mentioned today, some of them we haven't. So there is quite a big number of functions that you can try out. For most of them, you don't have to actually do any kind of pre-processing. It's all kind of packed already there. You just select, okay. A lot of them are actually working quite well with other languages, for example, Norwegian, uh, because you just import Norwegian stop words and you just go with it. Of course, it's not perfect, but it's working quite reasonably. Uh, for some of them, of course, you need to add some more, uh, do some more tweaking of the data. For example, Edmundson, um, this still, you still need to add those keywords that are domain specific. And, but as you can see here, there is one summarizer still there. So 60 years ago, and we're kind of still using it, and it's actually giving quite reasonable results. So it is not as bad <laughs> as we thought it would be. And of course, I mean, if you want to do any kind of deep learning models or stuff with the abstractive summarization, I would definitely recommend TensorFlow because you have to more or less have to use it for any kind of deep learning problems. Okay, that was all for me. Uh, thank you all very much for listening. Uh, I hope you learned something about the text summarization and I hope it was interested and hopefully it will also get you into going into more into trying to, okay, trying to try it out yourself. Uh, really, like uh, download Python uh, if you haven't had it already, this package also, it, everything is for free. So you can just try it out and create your own, at least extractive summarizers or something. Thank you all very much. Any questions?